good morning and welcome to this micrographics webinar. Uh, my name is Carlton Ryan. I'm doing today's webinar. And today we are covering Fusion 360 CAM administration. Basically, how to manage your CAM environment. Uh, just a note, the session will be recorded and all participants are muted. And you can take advantage of the chat panel to ask questions and I will answer these either as I see them or at the end during the Q&A session. Uh, as I said, my name is Carlton Roy and I'm an application engineer with Micrographics. My email address is up on the screen, call at mgfx.co.za. So if you have any questions, uh, you can also feel free to email those through. So moving on to today's agenda, uh, we'll be looking at the following topics, starting off with an introduction to CAM administration. Uh, here we'll cover a few areas uh, where using libraries can help. Uh, then we move on to highlighting the different types of libraries that are available and the benefits of using them and how they are used. Uh, before we move on to discussing setup sheets and configurations, and lastly, we'll close with the summary and Q&A session. So time for the intro. Uh, whether you are operating as a commercial enterprise you know, with a large machine shop, you have many machines that could be a mix of milling, turning, free access, uh, five axis simultaneous, um, or you're just a casual DIYer in the garage uh, this webinar will show you how libraries can help you organize your data um, that you are working with inside of Fusion 360. So now imagine this. You, you have a part that needs programming and you'll want to know what tools are available, what endmills you have, all those, you know, those sorts of tools that are available for you to actually use uh, and then make the decision on how to best program the part with those tools that you have or need to get in for making this tool. And to get this tooling information, especially for what you have on hand, you wouldn't want to go hunting through a list of Excel documents with all of the um, dimensions or going onto the machines and finding the tool tables on the machines and pulling up the tool dimensions to be able to input those into uh, Fusion. And, you know, even worse yet, having to physically go and dig through a cart and find a cutter and measure it to get the dimensions for that cutter. You, know, you would want to be able to find, go to one place and get all that information and pull it into your, your program pretty quickly and easily. And you know, at the same time, at this point, it would be helpful to also know the capabilities of the machines that you have, especially the programmer is still new and still learning the machines. You know, they have a part they want to design. They need to choose which machine they're going to design it on or program it for so that they know that machine's capabilities. Now, for example, uh, this machine on the image here to the right, you know, would that be suitable to make a part the size of a shoe? You know, it looks a bit big to me, so maybe choosing a smaller machine would be better. And more complex components may need five-axis machining. And so some of that information will be stored in these libraries. So once you've decided on a machine that's going to be used for the part and you found all the relative tools that you're going to use, you then need to decide on the appropriate operations or strategies. Um, you know, kind of what step overs and cutting depth should be used, uh, how much stock to leave is usually left when roughing. Uh, this valuable knowledge is usually stored in someone's head. You know, they'll do it from experience. They'll put these values in from their experience. But what happens if that person leaves? You know, they leave the company, that information goes with them. So let's put that worry aside for a second and uh, look at programming the part. Once all strategies are applied, how is that resulting program then output? Which post processor is used to create that NC file, that CNC file, and you know how do we output a setup sheet that explains what cutters are used, what is the maximum maximum Z depth, and having libraries and templates and configurations at your fingertip 
will help with answer all of these questions by giving you direct access to the information quickly and easily, saving you and the program a time. So stick with me and I'll show you how all of this is um, done and how it is achieved with, you, with the use of libraries inside of Fusion 360. Now, in the previous few slides, I raised some questions and I'm going to recap these questions. Yep. When you're programming, you need to decide what cutting tools, what cutter kind of tools do I have? Uh, what are their dimensions? Which of my machines is most suitable for this part? What are my go-to strategies for machining this type of part? Uh, how do I input, sorry, how do I output my program and setup sheets? In the next few slides, we'll look into what libraries are available and how they answer each of these above questions. And we'll do this by providing, uh, and they'll do this by providing consistency and standardization while being cloud-based for ease of access when editing and sharing. Uh, this also means that you don't need to worry about backing it up. Uh, we'll also see how they store intellectual property and retain the knowledge gained from years of collective experience from the employees. So you know, to sum up, once these libraries have answered all these questions, they will allow you to provide consistency and standardization while being cloud-based and easy to access and also storing that intellectual property. So the first library we'll look at is the tool library. Now, uh, without this, you pretty much can't machine your parts because you need to tell the program what tools you're using. And Fusion 360 comes with a vast set of sample tools pre-installed, and this will help you set up your own tool library. Uh, these pre-installed tool libraries are well organized into holders, probes, tools, and more with built-in filter and search functionality too. So that enables you to go through and search through those pre-installed libraries quite easily. So what you would do for your tool library, you would choose to create a local or cloud library, but I do recommend enabling cloud libraries and making use of those. That always makes sure that your libraries are backed up. You can access them from anywhere. You can start up a new PC, fresh installation of Fusion, and you can easily access your library. So populating your own library is as simple as finding the required sample tools and copying them into your library for editing. Doing this allows you to reuse the bulk of the settings and change only what you need. These settings will include things like your uh, tool geometry, like diameter and length, fluid count, and even holder information. Furthermore, you are able to create feeds and speeds profiles. This allows you to create a single tool that adjusts its cutting parameters for various materials or operations through a simple drop-down menu. Uh, these are just a few of the options available within the tool library. So let's have a quick look at this within the software to get a better idea. I'll go over here to Fusion 360 and I am in the manufacturing workspace. And in this manufacturing workspace, on the right hand side we have a, a manage panel. Your libraries are stored within this manage panel. You can click the drop down and you can view the various libraries. So the first one we were, we we're looking at is that tool library. So I'll access that. And on the left hand side, we can see the Fusion 360 library, which are the pre-installed libraries. We can see here we have our various samples. We have probes, tools, both in inch and metric. So if I want to find a tool, I can go to the sample tool metric, and there is a list here of those tools. On the right-hand side, there are the filters that I spoke about. So if I'm looking for a milling cutter, I can go to milling, and then I can choose the specific type. So let's say I'm looking for a bullnose. We'll filter out the bullnose, and we get a list of those bullnose cutters. <clears throat> you can filter this down further using various information like diameter, flute length, overall length. And once you have found the cutter that you want, I'm just going to grab this 10 millimeter cutter here. You're able to right click and copy that tool. Take it to a 
the library that you have created, you can either have a cloud library by right clicking on cloud new or local, doing the same process. I'm going to go to my training library here, right click and paste the tool in there. So that's populating the library. Now to edit this information, maybe the corner radius is not correct, you can right click on that tool and edit tool. This is where you would then put in information such as your vendor product ID and product link. Uh, we've got cutter information, basically the geometry and material of the cutter. Shaft information, if you need to have a more detailed shaft design on the cutter. The specific holder for this cutter. And then we get to the cutting data. If we have a look here, we've got our feeds and speeds. And on the left hand side we have the different we have the different profiles that come default with this cutter. So we've got aluminium for slotting, aluminium roughing, and we can see here at the bottom the step down changes there between those two and the step over. If we go to brass, we'll see that the spindle speed drops down. So each of these profiles changes the properties for that specific um, operation uh, and material. And these can be added to, they can be edited. You can also delete the ones that you don't need. You know, so if you're never going to machine titanium, you can delete those, take them out. And we also have post-processor options for your tool number, length offset numbers, um, the turret number, so where is it installed in the turret and whether or not you have uh, some options on the tool itself, like live tooling or manual tool changes. Once you've edited the tool, you can accept, and that will then have that tool edited in your tool library. And you can then repeat the process to populate the rest of the library. I'll close that down and go back in to our PowerPoint. That was the demo that we just had. And what we'll do from here is we will move on to the next most important library, and that would be the post processor. To be honest, this is something that you would typically look at right up front before even purchasing the software to see that you can get a post processor for your specific machine. Um, although there is a vast library of post processors, unfortunately, Autodesk can't have everything in there right up from the start. So the post-processor library, the same applies here as with the tool library. There's a large library of pre-installed post-processors with the possibility to filter according to capabilities such as milling, turning, additive, etc. Now this is great as it increases the chance of you getting up and running almost straight away with an existing post. However, having this large list can also be confusing. For example, do you use the FNUC or the FNUC Compact Post Processor? Uh, and this could lead to the wrong post processor being used by accident. So it's a good idea to create your own library and then populate it with only the post processors you need. Especially important if you are using customized post processors. You'd have a library with your customized post processors in that library. Additionally to being able to create your own library, you can also create subfolders. So let's say milling and turning to further divide your post processes that you use. So if you're looking for a turning post processor, you could just go into the turning folder. Alternatively, you could you know, use filters as well. So not forgetting that filters can also be applied to items in these folders. Uh, lastly, uh, there are tools directly in the library interface to import, export, and edit your post processor. So there's some buttons there that allows you to do that. And uh, we'll see some of this in the next demo segment that comes up. So after your post processor library and you've created your post processors or selected the post processors you need, put them into your library. The next library that you can take advantage of is the machine library. Now I'm covering the machine library third as it's more of an optional extra. Uh, at this moment there's a limited amount of functionality but some of what is in there is definitely useful. 
Uh, the most important thing here is the ability to set up the capabilities of the machine. Basically, you're setting what type of machine it is. Is it a mill? Is it a lathe? Uh, is it a water jet machine? There's various options available there. Uh, there's also a place to set the maximum workpiece size and weight. So once this is set, the next thing to look at would be to set the appropriate post processor for the machine. So we're looking at workpiece limitations, how big is the workpiece, and then also setting up what post processor you use from the uh, post processor you need to use for the machine. And apart from these settings, you can also store data such as the manufacturer, the model number, and overall size of the machine. And lastly, there's also a place to set up kinematics for the machine, basically how the axes are mounted relative to each other. But this is more important for fifth axis operation, though. We'll have a quick look at that in the demo that is coming up as well. So what does all of this mean with the machine library? And how does this help the programmer? Well, you're able to select the machine you plan to use while creating your initial setup. So we can see here on that image on the right-hand side, the machine selected there was the SDG 800 by 800 CNC router. Now, that is actually a custom machine that um, I built, and I've created that in Fusion so that I can use that machine when doing some hobby work in the garage. Now, once you've selected that machine, Fusion will then default the setup operation type and set also, and also set the post processor. So we can see there under setup, the operation type has changed to milling to match the capability of the machine. Later, when we post process the file out or the program out, post processor would be selected as well. So here we can see when post processing the program out, out at the bottom there, post. SDG Mach 3 mil. That is the post processor used for that machine. So at the same time when comparing, and at the same time, Fusion 360 will also compare certain settings within your setup and operations against those stored um, stored for the selected machine. And if there's a mismatch, this will result in a warning. Uh, so here we have some examples. The top piece, we loaded in a work piece that is larger than the machine supports in both the X and Y axis. So we get warnings for that. And in a later test there, also loaded in a tool that is not supported by, the, by that machine. Uh, so we see there the work piece is too large in X and Y. The machine also does not support the selected coolant type. Uh, maybe through tool coolant was selected, but the machine may not support through tool coolant. And so this allows the programmer right up front to start pushing out or start working away these errors and messages and not get to the machine and realize, oh, flip, the, you know, the work piece is too big, it can't fit, now we have to go to a different machine. And I always like to show these sorts of options within the program, so let's go have a quick look at this inside of Fusion. So back into Fusion 360, I'm going to go ahead first to the post library, select the post library, and we can see here in the post library, there is a list of Fusion 360 post processors. Once again, you are able to uh, filter this, so I'll go, let's say, to milling, and for the vendor, I'm going to go, I'll go ahead here and choose a Herco, the Herco vendor. We can see here that we have Herco and Herco 3D. Now, if I have a Herco machine, I can grab that and put it into my cloud library. I'm going to go ahead there and drag and drop that into the cloud library and select the library. And yeah, I can see a list of post processes in that library. Um, if I want to go to a specific, um, let's say, capability, I can go to milling. And I have actually moved files out of here, or the post processes out of that milling folder and the customers folder. But it's quite easy to grab that, let's say, Herco and drop it into the milling folder. So you can 
use that as an additional filter. So for customers, I may put in the Mitsubishi and the ABV. And so those are those processes that I may have customized for customers or found or got from Autodesk for customers. And I want to keep those so that I always have a reference for the customer's post-processor. Uh, once you select a post-processor, there are options here for editing the selected post-processor. You can copy it, import, export. So we have those options available here. I'll go back to cloud. We can see here I have the Artsoft SDG Mach 3 mil. So that is my customized Mach 3 post-processor that will be used on the SDG 800 by 800 machine. So that is the post library. Then moving on to the machine library, we can see the same setup. The user interface looks practically the same. I'll go ahead here to my cloud machines. There is the SDG 800 by 800. And clicking on the pencil to edit would allow me to edit the machine. So we have descriptions, uh, model numbers, vendors, the control that's used. But most importantly, if we go to capabilities, you can set up the capability to allow for filtering, um, the number of tools that the machine supports, the maximum tool lengths and diameters, even down to the maximum feed rates and blocks that it can read ahead. The other one here for workpiece would give you the maximum workpiece that you can put into the machine as far as the size and weight goes. Uh, then we have options for our kinematics, machining time. Uh, so you can put in the tool change time. This is a manual tool change. So you know, giving two minutes to do a tool change. And things like coolant. So this machine does not have any coolant at the moment. So there is no coolant selected. If air was installed, we could put in there air and add that capability for coolant. And the last one here we'll look at now is post-processing. You'll see here Mach 3 allows for allowing for six offsets in Mach 3. And the post location is in the cloud and it is the SDG Mach 3 post. So that is set up under the machine configuration. We'll close those off and we will see how that um, goes into the setup. We'll right click on the setup and we'll go to, oh, sorry, right click on this setup here and we can go to the edit option. And when either creating a setup or editing a setup, you are able to select a machine and then make that selection. Now, I'm assuming this will probably give an error when I hit OK here. Surprisingly not. So this machining setup here would work on that selected machine. If you want to remove the machine, you can hit the X and remove that machine. Yeah. Let's go back to the... Next section of the, uh, the webinar and or the next library, and that is the template library. Now, your template library um, is a place where you can store a pre-built set of operations and their associated settings. Um, so it's a place where you can load in operations with those settings. And this helps reduce programming time and effort as the programmer can easily pull in the predefined or that predefined set of roughing or semi-finishing and finishing operations. The only thing left then to do would be to set the geometry selections and double check or change any settings. Uh, for example, the selected tool and step over. Uh, this is extremely useful if you machine a lot of similar parts. Uh, where there's no, there's, uh, where there's not large geometry changes or process changes. So, you know, we've got some templates there on the right-hand side, that image there. 
And if those were to be laser cut and etched, you may have um, you may have three different operations. You would have an operation to laser cut the internal profiles, a operation to laser cut the external profiles, and a operation to etch the markings in. So those three operations could be loaded from that template. All the settings predefined, you know, your, your laser, um, your laser power or speeds to do a good quality cut, your power and speeds for etching. And the only thing you would need to do is pick the relative geometry. So for you know for your internal domain or your, your internal profiles, you would go into that operation and select those internal profiles and repeat the process for that geometry. And that then does reduce your programming time. So by using the templates, you're able to save time and keep a level of consistency in the strategies used. Because you're using the same strategies part to part, you have that consistency. And this can in turn aid in keeping the surface finish consistent from part to part, because you're using the same strategies to finish those parts. Now obviously, if you're looking at parts with shallow Z height changes or parts with steep walls, your strategies will change there. So you may create multiple templates, uh, one where you have a template for, let's say, machining steep walls, and another where you have templates for machining shallow surfaces with minor changes in Z height. And this is great because you're storing these operations with this intellectual property in there, and it's a great way to build up a library of knowledge from the programs. As the programmers gain more experience and store more information in these templates to aid them, they're also storing that experience for people to draw from later on. So in this way, if the programmer leaves the company, less knowledge is taken with that programmer. They leave some of that behind in the company in the form of these templates. And that makes it a lot easier for someone new to come in and pick up the company's standards of machining. It keeps a consistency across personnel changes, across parts, and provides a good, a good library of information to draw from um, you know, day on day. And uh, the sorry, let's go through a demo here on the setup sheet configuration. So I missed the demo slide there, but uh, we'll go. Uh, sorry, not setup sheet configuration. Uh, let's look at doing a demo on the template libraries. So we'll go here into Fusion. I am actually going to open up a test component. Okay, so here we have a nested part loaded. And what we're able to do is we are able to go into the setup, right click on that and use the create from templates option to load a predefined template. Now you'll see here I have the plasma profiles template that was pre-created. I'll show you how that was done once I've loaded this in. But the Selecting the plasma profiles will then load two operations in. And you're able to then select one of those operations, choose edit, and select the geometry that you wish to cut. So I'm going to go ahead here and if we just select, let's say, first four. I'm not going to waste time and go and select all of them. But we can do that to generate that first path that will cut all the internal holes and then the second one we'll go edit and go ahead and select the outer profiles and you can see here in this case um, this is predefined with a tab width to allow for tabbing so the parts don't fall out so we have tab width settings already created here on the geometry panel if we go back to the first one and edit that, because those are the internals with the drop out, there are no tabs set on that. So different information predefined within those two toolpaths 
to give us two different results. You know, we have the internals, we want those dropouts to fall out, and then the external, keeping those components tabbed in, in place. And if we were doing, uh, let's say, laser cutting and we wanted to etch, we could have a first op, which would do the etching before any of the cutting is done. Now, once you've set this up, what you're able to do is you're able to select the operations that you want to add into a template and right-click on those and choose to store as template. So I'm going to go ahead and choose the store as template, give it a name, so I'm just going to call this Demo Plasma, and give it a description, so inner and outer operations for plasma cutting. Then you can choose a location. Uh, so <clears throat> once again, your libraries have various folders that you can create. So here I'm going to go ahead and just select the cloud library, and have it put it straight into the cloud library and not into a subfolder. So I'll just put it straight into cloud, hit save, and that profile is then saved. Or should I say that uh, template is then saved? So if I go back up here, create from template, we now have the demo plasma template. So you can pre create these templates, or as you start programming parts, you realize, hey, this actually is a useful set of operations. You can store that as a template um, within the templates library. Now if we go back to the templates library here in the manage panel, we can then go in and actually see uh, if I go into clips, there's a toolpath for machining clips, there's a roughing toolpath with roughing operations, and we can see the description here and the list of operations. So this does an adapter uh, roughing, it then does a pocket contour and then a scallop to finish it all. So you're able to go in and also manage your your toolpaths, your toolpath templates from within the library here as well. So you can see I've got various libraries loaded or various templates loaded here. So that would be your template setup. Let's head back into PowerPoint and we'll look at the setup sheet configurations. Now what are setup sheet configurations? Um, basically you are able to configure and create predefined configurations on automated or automatically created setup sheets. Um, so basically like a report you're able to select a program and then generate the setup sheet that will house or store information with regards to that program. So you can create predefined configurations and set the visibility of properties for each configuration. So on the right hand side there, we can see that there are two different sets. Uh, we have sections, so you can choose to have a summary section in your, in your setup sheet, or you could switch that little R off, switch the visibility of the summary off, so you only have tools, setup, and operations. Um, if you have somebody who is only going to make sure the machine is prepped with tools and the stock set up, and they don't need to know about operations, you can switch operations off. And then specifically for each of those sections, you can choose to have properties visible or not. So we can see there's a couple of different properties, um, product version, so what version of Fusion was used to create it, what the design document is, um, how many setups are within the machine. All those various properties can be switched on and off. And you can create multiple configurations depending on the uh, who's going to receive the setup and what they need to do with it. So here, on the next slide, we actually see an example setup sheet on the right-hand side. That is a very simple block that is getting a few millimeters surfaced off the top, actually getting a two millimeter cut off the top of it. Basically a facing operation. 
So what we see here is we have a job description, one document part that actually just tells you basically the document name. And then you have setup. So we can see there it is set up in WCS0, so that is the um, G54 standard work coordinate system, the size of the stock, the final part size. So we can actually compare the two sizes there. We see that we're only taking two millimeters off the top. And then it gives you the stock position. Um, so it gives you the position according to the WCS. This will also help you, uh, and with the image, help you aim, uh, just help you to see where you are also going to probe and zero your machine. Uh, we then have a uh, the total, which is basically your summary section, number of operations and tools, with some speeds and feeds information. The tool list, this is a single operation with a single tool, so we have information with regards to the tool itself. And then we also have the operations. So like I said, single operation, we only have one operation listed here. That gives you the information with regards to that operation. Now, both within tools and operation, if you look specifically at the tool information, that information would have been what you filled in inside of your tool library. And you'll see there, this tool specifically is a Sompter cutter. And the product code there is the actual product code from Sompter. And in the tool library, you're able to put a web link in. And so clicking on that product code there will take you to that web link so you can get direct access to the uh, desired web page with information for that specific cutter. So whoever is looking at the setup sheet can actually access more information with regards to that cut if they wish to uh, directly from that setup sheet. So how is this sheet generated? How do we get this information? This is done uh, most easily by doing it from the, generating it from the NC program. Now, NC program is one way of outputting your, your tool parts. So I'm going to go back to this file here. And I'm going to go to the containments and height setup. There are various operations within the setup. And right-clicking on that setup will allow you to create NC program. There is an option here for setup sheet. However, Clicking that will create the default setup sheet for everything and you would save that onto your hard drive. And before I actually go and create a setup sheet, we need to look at how we can configure it. So once again, we'll go to manage, setup sheet configurations, and that will bring up the configuration window that we saw in the slideshow. At the top, we have a drop-down where we can choose the configuration type. So detailed is the default. Right-clicking on a setup and choosing to save a setup sheet would do a detailed setup sheet. We can then also take this and basically save as and create a copy or a new custom setup. So I'm going to call this custom setup sheet and that custom setup sheet might not include operations so we'll take operations off and we may not be interested in things like rapid distance cutting distance uh, let's say tools let's have a look number of operations might not be important create a date might not be important, product version may not be important. So we'll just switch those off and then hit save and that will save that setup. Change this back to detailed and close off. Now, as I mentioned, right clicking on a setup and choosing the setup sheet option, that would export a standard detailed setup. So if I just go to desktop and save this on desktop.
You can open up that HTML file. And that has all that information in there. So we can see all the operations. So that's the default detailed operation. Or setup sheet, should I say. Going to the uh, first creating a NC program from the from the setup and uh, you know setting up whatever you may need to in the NC program itself and one thing to note here post processing is automatically selected according to the machine we can hit OK and then from that NC program you're able to create setup sheet but this way when you select the create setup sheet it publishes the setup sheet to the cloud so you're able to give it a name and a location I just want to change the location here quickly um, yeah okay let's just keep it there where it is but you can change and choose a location where you want to save that setup sheet uh, I'm just going to throw it here into the training folder hit save and that will then save out that setup sheet now once that setup sheet is saved you then get the option to go and choose the format so you can go with custom setup sheet I'll scroll down here we have tools but we have no operations listed so there is information there that is not that was not chosen to be in this case you can then also print this out using your default printer uh, so you get the option to print that out as well from here so that would be setup sheet creation through the NC programs uh, there are also various ways of other various ways of setting it up um, or should I say outputting it but the um, generally you would create that setup sheet from NC programs that is also stored on Fusion Teams so you can access that through uh, the Fusion Teams cloud access uh, cloud drive so it makes it easily accessible and it is also versioned every time you make a change and update it you get a new version of that setup sheet um, you can also generate setup sheets through an Excel um, post processor. So I would actually take that setup, go to the post process option, and under the uh, it's going going to have to use the installed post libraries. Under the installed post libraries, there is a setup sheet. Excel post processor and this will actually take that and export all the information required to an Excel spreadsheet so there is that setup option there as well uh, just a little note to add here is that there is also a tool sheet so you can also export a tool sheet as well so there are post processors here for exporting two documents A little bit of an added extra there. Okay, gone through the demo for that already. And so, in summary, how does in summary, how do these libraries help you? Uh, these libraries help you by staying organized with your data and that organization is going to help you improve the ease of programming, the ease of finding information. Um, it will help speed up the programming process because your programmer doesn't have to sit and find and measure dot uh, tools. They don't have to sit and figure out what would be the best operation. That template may already be set up and saved for them just to pull in. They only have to choose geometry and maybe tweak some things and things. Um, it keeps your outputs consistent. By using these templates, you don't have every other person using different information, outputting different, um, let's say, setup sheets. So it creates a consistent output, especially with feeds and speeds and surface finishes. And 
it stores intellectual property long term. You have a place to store that information and pass it on to new employees. You don't lose that information when employees leave. And it helps you essentially organize all these intellectual property assets with infusion, makes it easily accessible so that you can just pull that information in as you're working in Fusion. You don't have to go out to any other program. It's all within Fusion 360. So nice quick summary there, just highlighting some of those positive points. There are a lot more positive points within the presentation itself. But just to close off with a quick summary, we will also field any questions. If there are no questions, we will then close off the webinar. Okay, no questions have come through. We will then finish off. Uh, I'd just like to say thank you for attending the webinar or watching this later on YouTube. This was recorded. It will be uploaded onto YouTube. So thank you for watching and you can like and subscribe to our YouTube Facebook, sorry, our YouTube page, our channel, where all of our webinars are uploaded. Um, thank you once again for joining. If you have any questions, you can also email. My email was on the, on the second slide. We also have an info email on this slide, so you can send through that information. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the presentation.